안녕하세요. 삼성 서울병원 치주과에 있는 양승민입니다. Greetings, I'm Dr. Yang Seungmin at Art Periodontal Department in Samsung Seoul Hospital. Today in this master course, I'm going to talk about different classification of bone defects and the way to treat them. First, I'm going to look at the classification of bone defect and following that classification, I'm going to talk about treatment and end off with take home message. After extraction, or when you face a patient, you'll be able to face these kind of situations quite frequently. There are areas where there are teeth and where it's edentulous. If you look at the occlusal table, the difference in width is clear. If you look at the upper, there's difference in terms of width, but there's also a difference in terms of the height as well. Compared with where there's teeth in terms of dimension, there's atrophy, especially in the anterior area. After extraction, if you look at situations where it's been some time since extraction, we need to treat it separately. Since the past, there has been different classification regarding the changes that occur in the alveolar bone. The first the classification was presented by Atwood. As we all know, this is before extraction, right after extraction, and with time, the alveolar bone the top part becomes reserved. This is very important in implant placement, but this area turns a high round knife edge, low round. This is a situation where basal bone resorption has occurred as well, and this is followed by recessed type. With time, these changes can be observed. We reference uh, this classification uh, commonly and we follow it. When you look at it, it is quite difficult to understand what kind of implications it would have with antagonist relationship. The antagonist relationship will be looked at. This is similar to Edward's classification. This is right after extraction and with time. It changes from high round to knife edge and then a recessed type. The resorption progresses as shown and in the lower it becomes resorbed like this. It's the same with the anterior and it's the same with the lower. There is a slight difference with Atwood classification because you can check the occlusal relationship. This is normal occlusion. However, with continuous recession and resorption, if you place the implant in the correct position in light of that environment, it will be like this. Then the interarch relationship will change from what we could have gained. If we place the implant in a position where it should be, then we would witness the bone defects. How such tendency is reflected. The amount is important, but the contour of it is very important. These days, I see these kind of patients very frequently. The existing implants are like this. Here you can see through the implant, and over here, because of peri-implantitis, it is exposed. In order to restore this situation, what can we do? I consulted with the patient and removed the implant. After removal, it's clear. You can see significant vertical bone loss compared with adjacent teeth. If you look at the occlusal table, there is a horizontal bone resorption tendency. After extraction, the changes that occur in the bone, we need to observe that keenly. A lot of studies have been done previously. There are many different classifications, but I've summarized this so that we can understand it intuitively. If there's defect in ridge, there can be a defect after extraction 
horizontal bone resorption, vertical bone resorption. This is simple classification. Within a horizontal bone defect, it can be divided into fenestration dehiscence and horizontal ridge defect. In Austin, different classifications have been reviewed and a new classification dividing into type 1, 2, 3, and 4 has been devised. Type 1 refers to extraction socket. From type 2 to type 4, this shows different stages of changes the extraction defect goes through after extraction. Horizontal defect, the vertical defect, and composite defect. This is the classification. This occurs in the anterior and posterior area. In the case of anterior area, it's the same with posterior, but we need to classify the extraction socket. If you look at this image, there may be various reasons leading up to extraction, such as fracture or failure of endotreatment. At times, hard tissue and soft tissue can be intact, or the soft tissue can be within the normal frame, but there can be lack of hard tissue, or there can also be lack of both hard and soft tissue. This is a normal defect. These two types, where there's insufficient hard and soft tissue, can be referred to as a damaged extraction defect. We need to differentiate these types and treat them accordingly. Next, let's look at horizontal defect. We can divide into two scenarios in this case, where there is a small defect and where there is extensive defect. When we place one or two implants, depending on the situation, there can be dehiscence or fenestration. When there is extensive large defect, you need to consider whether it is intrabony defect, which is within the ridge, or extrabony defect, which is beyond the ridge. There's a lot of different terms that are used interchangeably, so you may hear certain words being expressed in a different way depending on the lecturer, but this is the basic definition. In horizontal small defect, as shown on this image, there is dehiscence defect and fenestration defect. As for dehiscence defect, in the crystal area, a couple of thread can be exposed. As for fenestration, the crystal portion is intact, but as for middle or apical area, the implant can be exposed, and that is the kind of defect you refer to as fenestration defect. As shown on this image, when the ridge width is insufficient, this kind of defect can be observed. If you look over here, the crystal part, there is bone, but over here, a couple of threads are exposed because of concavity, defect can be exposed. I'm sure you'll be able to come across these cases as you provide clinical treatment. Let's move on to horizontal large defect. It does not involve one or two teeth, but involves a three or more or the entire arch. As shown here, if you look at the contour of the alveolar bone, it's like this. If we are to place implant here, it is within the boundary of adjacent bone, so it is intrabony defect. You can also mark it as inside or outside. Your choice of terminology may vary depending on your preference. If the art is like this, and if the implant placement position is outside the arc, it is extra bony defect. 
As shown on this image, if the arch contour is like this, in this case, the implant placement position is within the boundary. Therefore, we can call this intrabony defect. If you look over here, bone defect has continued for a significant period and extensive horizontal bone loss occurred. And if the placement position is outside the adjacent architecture, this is extra bony defect. Next, moving on to vertical defect. If the available bone is insufficient, or compared with adjacent bone, if the height is insufficient, we can call this a vertical defect. As shown on this image, the height of adjacent bone is like this, but over here it's a sunken. This is vertical defect. Composite defect is combination of horizontal and vertical defect. It is deficient of width and height of bone. In the anterior area, as you can see, there is pus and the height loss can be observed. In this case, it looks as if the height is regular, but as shown earlier, the extraction socket is going to be like this. From a occlusal view, the width is going to be lacking as well. In line with such defect, how are we going to treat it? We have made a differentiation up until this point, and when you do extraction, you do immediate implant placement or socket preservation. In most cases, GBR is used frequently. In addition, block bone or distraction of osteogenesis can be used. In most cases, you find the right GBR procedure for the right indication. As mentioned earlier, you need to provide a treatment following type 1, 2, 3, and 4. Yes, you may have a certain procedure that you may prefer but you need to understand about guided bone regeneration properly in order to be able to provide good clinical treatment. We have made classification earlier in the case of type 1 defect. If there's not a lot of a bone deficiency, I do immediate implant placement and provide an immediate provisional. I do this at times and in other times I don't. I do socket preservation at times, too. If there is deficiency, what should we do? As shown, if there is a hard tissue or soft tissue deficiency, how are we going to restore it? Many people have different opinions on it. But you need to really understand the gist of it in order to approach it properly. For instance, if there's sufficient soft tissue height, you can do immediate implant placement and you can use bone substitutes for the bone defect to restore the case. If there is a lack of soft and hard tissue, then you may wait after extraction and utilize GBR when placing implant. There can be various options. This is difficult to address all in today's lecture, so if the opportunity arises, perhaps you can listen in the offline lecture and have a meaningful discussion. In my case, if there is a significant bone deficiencies in a lot of cases, I restore it like this. I've used, in this case, socket preservation. How to do this kind of treatment? This is a similar case. In case where there is lack of soft and hard tissue, immediate implant placement can be utilized to restore these kind of cases. And restoration was delivered like this. So there is a bit of exposure here, but if you look at the contour, you can see that a lot of soft tissue has been restored. 
as mentioned, how to apply which kind of procedure is difficult to address at this moment. Perhaps you can come to offline lectures. Classification was done earlier, and you can use GBR, block bone, or ridge splitting. You need to know the proper indication for these procedures. It is a very difficult to address all here, and as mentioned earlier, if there is a slight dehiscence defect, you need to understand whether this is within the bony envelope, intrabony defect, extra bony defect. GBR can be used. In this case, it was very tight. If there is bone loss of over half of the implant diameter that is to be placed horizontally, then this can be referred to as horizontal defect. In that case, block bone graft can be done. You need to choose the right indication and make a decision. As you can see here, there is a defect and there is exposure as mentioned earlier, although extensive. If it is intrabony defect, then you can do GBR and restore it. You can do it very simply as shown earlier. If it is like this, if it is outside and imp implant is placed here, then you need to sufficiently widen bone width before implant placement and thereafter you need to do implant placement. It's the same with a vertical bone defect. You can utilize a GBR and block bone graft. What are we going to use as a basis and criteria? You need to determine that as we proceed with treatment. In this case, block bone graft was done. I have a set criteria that if the area where implant placement should be done requires over 3 millimeters of augmentation, then I use a block bone graft. As shown here, this is minor defect. In this case, I use GBR. This is going to be under 3 millimeters. Based on what you use as criteria with the same defect and the extent, you may choose different procedures accordingly. This is composite defect with a horizontal and vertical bone defect. It's the same here. You can use GBR or block bone graft. GBR can be divided into resorbable and non-resorbable materials. You can determine the amount of augmentation if you use titanium mesh. As shown here, the bone defect is quite horizontally and vertically significant. Block bone and a GBR was done at the same time to gain width sufficient for implant placement. I will now summarize the discussion that we've had about the bone defect and how to treat them. Except for extraction socket, there can be three different treatment modalities for horizontal, vertical, and composite defect. You can utilize GBR or block bone graft in all cases. This can be applied universally. As for ridge split, this can be applied only when there is a horizontal bone defect. I hope you utilize this table as you differentiate and categorize defect and ways to find the right treatment. Today we've talked about the different classifications and treatment methods. So what is most important clinically is how much you are used to that procedure. If opportunity arises, I hope you come to the offline lecture and listen to me and other gurus and find the right technique that is right for you. Thank you for your attention.